Good morning. It is 10 minutes past 10 a.m. and we're here with COVID-19 360. We're waiting uh, the latest updates from the press brief and that hasn't started yet. And so we'll take you through, um, you know, some of the stories that have come up before the press brief. And hopefully if that happens, then we'll cross over to that. But today we'll, we'll talk a bit more about the Ashanti region. A number of things are happening, including the fact that a prison inmate is said to have tested positive. This is from the Kumasi Central Prisons, uh, prisons and he said to have contracted the virus whilst on admission at a hospital. And so this did not happen whilst he was uh, in cells. And so we'll give you more brief on that and also talk about the fact that yesterday there was news about the uh, treatment centers in the Ashatan region uh, being full. And so as a result, they were asking for an isolation center separate from the other wards so that they can keep the other uh, infected patients there. And so we'll give you an update on what the Ashanti Regional Health Directorate has said concerning this particular issue and the expansion of some facilities to also give room for more uh, patients to also be treated. And so anyway, my name is Brella Mundi and I'm doing this with Anita. Yes, I'm Anita Kufu. And from the last update on the Ghana Health Service website, we have 397 new cases and also some 84 new recoveries, moving our tally from 12,193 to 12,150. And so that is the 550, I beg your pardon, and that is the new update. And so this is COVID-19 360. I know the show is big on your conversations and your uh, you know, opinions as well. And so you can send everything in and then we will be glad to read all of it right here, Bella. Absolutely. So remember to send those messages in. We'll be speaking to Eugene, who's a virologist, uh, to tell us more about this disease. We'll also be speaking to Dr. Betha Sewa Ayi. Some few developments. Um, there's also an update about children and how they are less likely uh, to die from COVID-19, even though there's sad news. Uh, yesterday, we found out that a three-month-old baby is part of the people who lost their lives in the northern region as a result of COVID-19. And that's heartbreaking. Yesterday, there was an update about eight new people have lost their lives as a result. And the age range is from uh, 33 years all the way to 69 years. And so uh, we have some males and some females, some with comorbidities, others without any known ailments apart from COVID-19. And they unfortunately lost their lives. And so this is also just another mm -hmm. reminder for you to continue to wear your nose mask where you can't keep... Uh, a fair distance between yourself and the next person. And also, remember to continue washing your hands with soap and the lost their lives as a result of COVID-19 and whether they had any comorbidities or not. Let's take a look at Ghana's case count. And so, like I mentioned earlier, 397 new cases have been recorded right here in Ghana with our active cases now at 8,000. 114 and confirmed cases at 12,590 and 84 new recoveries moving our recoveries to 4,410 and an eight more deaths moving our death toll from 58 to 66 and when you go on the Ghana Health Service website and looking at the dashboard Greater Accra region is still leading with 7,419 and the Ashanti region second with 2,300 and 62 the western region seven cases away from the thousand mark and as at this last update it is at 993 the central region with 694 and still the Ahafo region has one case the Buno region one northeast two Buno east region 14 and then the upper west region with 32 and now let's get more details on how our testing is also you know moving on with regard to the uh, surveillance, the general surveillance, the enhanced contact tracing, and also the mandatory quarantine as well. And so, out of the 12,590 confirmed cases, general surveillance is contributing 5,171 cases, and the enhanced contact tracing, 7,400. And 19. And so when you look at the recoveries as well, it's still uh, 4,410 with severe at 13 and critical cases at 4 and deaths at 66. Now let's look at the total number of tests that has been done so far. And for the routine surveillance, 85,305 tests have been conducted. And out of that, 5,171 tested positive. And for the contact tracing, 172,705 tests have been done, and then 7,419 of it 
tested positive. And so in totality, 258,010 tests have been done so far. And let's get more details also on the deaths as well. That is the new deaths that have been recorded. And when you go on the Ghana Health Service website, it gives you the, the number of deaths. I mean, from 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, and then 66. The last death was the 58th. And so now we've moved from 59 all through to 66. And for the sex as well, it gives you whether the person is a male or a female, and then the age range, and then the comorbidity, whether the person had any underlying uh, health conditions and also the region. So uh, the 59th uh, death was a female of uh, age 52 years and she had a comorbidity of diabetes and then uh, it happened in the Ashanti region. Uh, the 60th death is a male, 69 years, also diabetic uh, mellitus and then hypertension and then the region, Greater Accra region. 60, the 61st death is also a male, 33 years, no comorbidity, in the Ashanti region and the 62nd is a female 30 years sickle cell uh, disease and also in the Ashanti region and then the 63rd is also a male 33 years uh, hypertensive in the greater Accra region and so the age range you realize that we have more of the uh, 30s appearing you know for this particular um, you know number of deaths we've recorded both in the Ashanti and in the greater Accra region and when we move on to the 64th, it is a male, uh, 64 years, hypertensive and in the Ashanti region. And for the 65th, we also have a female, 39 years, no comorbidity. And she uh, died in the Ashanti region. And the 66th is also a male, 33 years, no comorbidity. And the death happened in the Ashanti region. And so hmm, it, it looks like now whether you have a comorbidity or not, and you are infected by the virus, the probability of you passing on that as if your immune system is not strong enough is quite high because initially we were told that uh, people with underlying medical conditions were the ones the passing on. But now mm -hmm. the, the, the trend is changing and it is rather unfortunate. But looking at the ages 33, 39, 33 again, the 30s and quite young. Yeah, very young. And so as much as you're trying to stay safe, just try to also boost your immune system and you know eat healthy that's the most important thing and let's pray that we don't get more people dying from COVID-19 it's here to stay with us we need to also find a way to live with it and stay healthy that's the most important I need to, I don't know if you have some more uh, um information on there this, but anyway, this is how it looks like talking about the Ashanti region as well so yesterday we talked about the fact that the Ghana Medical Association had alerted and cautioned as well that if um, the Ashanti region did not get a separate isolation and treatment center, we're going to record more cases and more deaths. And that's because now they didn't have a choice than to send COVID-19 patients into the accident wards. And that's because the isolation centers and treatment centers were full. Now in Kumasi, there were two main places or there are two main places um, that house COVID-19 patients. And that's the Kumasi South Hospital, which has the biggest bed capacity with 20 beds and at the moment, and Comfanochi with 18 beds. As of yesterday, all these beds were full. And so now um, the Ashanti Regional Director of Health, Dr. Emmanuel Tinkran, has given updates on that. And he says that there are plans to increase the bed capacity in some of these hospitals. And also, the, a doctor has, was willing to give his private facility um, to be used as an isolation center. So Kumasi South, they are looking at increasing the bed capacity to 41. And so 21 more beds will be provided. There's also a plan to provide seven more beds at the Suntresi government, Suntreso government hospital as well. And 97 health workers have contracted the virus. On the line, we have Eugene Sebastian, Arthur. He's a virologist and he'll be speaking to us. Good morning, Eugene. Bella. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Now, quickly, before we even talk about beds, there was an update concerning, uh, you know, a notification that the virus has started mutating. And so it's changing in behavior. And that is going a long way to determine how we proceed with management of cases in the country. Is that true? And what does that mean? Yeah. Um, anyway, good morning to your viewers. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that we, we are making too much out of the mutations we are seeing okay. as to whether this mutation is actually changing the virus's uh, behavior. This is not well documented. 
It is something that uh, researchers are still looking into. But however, the virus has not really changed so much. Mm. The mutations we are seeing are not really in areas where uh, we think it is causing much of a difference in its behavior. Okay. So. To me, I would advise this morning that we shouldn't reach so much into it okay. and allow the researchers to delve more into looking at the sequences of the genome and how it affects the behavior of the virus. So, yes, then people are coming up with a lot of things on mm. the genome and the behavior of the virus, but we shouldn't reach so much into it for now. All right. As long as there's no cause to worry, that's understandable. But let's take a look at the eight people who have died as a result of COVID-19. Bringing our update to, um, you know, um, 66, actually. Uh, 66 people who have died from COVID-19. Now, the youngest person right. amongst them is a 30-year-old, okay, with mm -hmm. sickle cell. And also, we have a 39-year-old who had no comorbidity, a 33-year-old with no comorbidity. Are the dynamics changing? Because the belief earlier was that people with comorbidity were more susceptible to dying from the virus. Now, we're recording people without any underlying ailment also passing on. What could this mean? Yeah, um, I think the first thing we have to understand is that we have learned the virus, we have studied the virus over time, okay? So there is a lot of progress being made in the uh, research area. Now, when we started, we saw certain things that we are, uh, we didn't see certain things that we are seeing now, okay? Mm. That doesn't mean that the whole dynamic is changing. It's just that we are learning more. We are understanding it better. Okay. So to, for people to have um, underlying diseases and die, and for people to not have underlying diseases and die, it's, mm. they are both um, uh, equal outcomes that can come from uh, the infection. Now, let me explain something quickly. Okay. That when you are seeing these cases in Ghana, the question is how many people out there were having no um, diseases outlining the COVID-19, which was killing them. That's mm. the question we have to ask. The reality is that we had people, a lot of people who were having um, underlying diseases who were dying, but that did not outnumber or compare to those who had underlying diseases. Now, let me state it clear that it didn't mean that there was no one with an underlying disease. Who, who, you just check the Ghanaian numbers. Yeah. We realized that the people who had um, uh, comorbidity, okay, or people who died with underlying diseases and um, as a result of COVID-19, mm -hmm. were uh, are still more than those who had nothing at all. Okay. You can check the numbers and see. Yeah. When you look at the percentage, that it's, it's almost insignificant. Does it make sense? So okay. the fact that people are dying without any underlying diseases is not uh, particularly strange. It's not strange. But could it mean that these people might be walking about with illnesses that they do not know of? On, or also, it could mean that they might have very weak immune systems and they are not aware of it. It's a possibility. It. Yes, it's a possibility. Um, so if, if, if the result comes out and they say there's no underlying disease, then it means that the doctors did their check and mm -hmm. they realize that this person is fit. You understand? However, yeah. if these people died and nothing was done, maybe there's no autopsy, there's nothing done to check if the person was sick um, with something else or was diseased with something else, then yes, it's possible that they had an illness that was hidden. But it's something that I've always said, that the problem with um, our, our developing countries is that mm -hmm. most of us don't know our health status because we barely go to um, the hospital for checkups, yeah. you know, like it's done elsewhere. So, and that is where the fear comes in when it comes to COVID-19. You know, if you don't know what your status is and you, you get a virus, anything can happen to you. So even this is a time that I think people should actually check up to know their status. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are seeing right now. Okay. Now, final one before we link to the press briefing. We're here grappling with bed capacity in the Ashanti region and in some treatment centers um, in other regions as well. Did we not see this coming and could we not have planned better for this situation? Bella, this is a very good question you're asking. I mean, it's, it's a question that I, I, was, uh, I was actually discussing with my brother some few minutes ago that mm. we were so complacent at some point, you know, when we started talking about the um, peaking and all those things. We were complacent at the mm. point. And that is something that we have to be really careful moving forward. We need to prepare for everything, you know, because look at Ebola happened in 2014. And um, I was thinking that by now we should be already prepared for COVID-19 because of Ebola. But yeah. the fact that they entered Ghana, we didn't really look into it. But now we have COVID-19. We have to actually work so fast on getting ourselves set for any um, uh, detrimental issues that it will bring to the economy. Um, I was also saying that we should be very careful with how we look at 
the elections coming up. Because if you don't take care, you push all attention to politics, which is very sensitive to everyone. Mm. Okay, and forget that there is a pandemic lurking. So we have to be really careful. And all that right. is the situation with the beds now. We all were right. so complacent and we didn't really push for so many things. Okay. Now this is the situation we have. We've managed the case so well, looking at how far we've come. Okay. But moving forward, we have to be really we careful. We can do better. All right. Thank you so much. Eugene Sebastian Arthur is a virologist, giving us some um, feedback on what he thinks about the situation so far. With the directors for the Ghana Health Service updating us on numbers, case counts so far, as well as um, the amendment of some aspects of, um, you know, issues concerning asymptomatic and symptomatic patients as well. So currently the case count is 12,929 and out of um, 261,319 tests conducted. So as it stands now, positivity rate is 4.95% and recovery stands at 4,468 with death still at 66,000. So currently the active cases are 8,395 and these are cases that are either being managed at isolation um, or treatment centers or at home. 14 are severe cases with four in critical conditions, all on ventilators as well. Uh, there was a breakdown of the regional case count. When we come back, uh, we all know that the NPP parliamentary primaries is taking place this Saturday, the 20th of June. There are two hotspots, and we're going to be speaking to two aspirants who will be contesting some incumbents in that particular area to find out what measures they are putting in place to ensure that, you know, their constituents are protected whilst voting. Well, I'm talking about the electorate. And also, uh, moving forward, how are they being able to uh, campaign even in this COVID era. We'll be back. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. We'll be speaking to some two NPP aspirants who are looking to take the seats from some incumbents to represent the party at the national elections. But before that, let's take a look at um, the news for today. Welcome to news update on COVID-19 360. As part of the fight against the spread of COVID-19 in Jaraba prison received on Friday, June 12, a batch of protective and hygiene materials and equipment for the benefit of detainees and staff from the UNDP. We are very happy to receive this donation. This disease has no borders. Prisoners and prison staff can also contract it. Prisoners can die from COVID-19. He spares no one. We are very pleased with the gesture of our partners, said Hubert Yandom, manager of Jaraba prison. This kit aims to put in place protective devices to combat and prevent the spread of the coronavirus within the prisons in the Central African Republic and to support the prison administration in the fight against COVID-19. Players kneeled in support of the Black Lives Matter movement and victims of coronavirus were remembered as the Premier League made a somber return on Wednesday from a 100-day shutdown that deprived England of its national support when Manchester City scored the first goal the Premier League had seen in more than three months only health workers were in the stands to applaud for the last three months it's been the nation applauding the health workers in protective clothing they were among only 300 people allowed into the stadium for the game against Arsenal which helped end in the Premier League's 100-day shutdown on Wednesday the 55,000 seats that would usually be filled were instead empty mostly covered by banners the UN Refugee Agency and the World Food Programme are joining forces in Libya in a project that will aim to reach up to 10,000 food insecure refugees and asylum seekers with energy food with emergency food aid this year. The partnership was launched in recognition of the severe socio-economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in Libya as well as the effects of its ongoing conflict. Nutritious food supports a healthy immune system which is even more critical in challenging times like these. Regular food support help to meet this basic need and allow for limited income to be used for other needs. Most refugees and asylum seekers in Libya have been unable to find any daily work to support themselves as curfews have been introduced and food prices and the cost of basic goods have, have dramatically risen. Burundi's newly elected president Everest Deshme is due to be sworn in shortly two months earlier than planned. Attendees are being asked to arrive early to allow time for coronavirus precautions such as hand washing and temperature checks, AFP report. The fast-track ceremony comes after his predecessor Pierre Kuruziza died suddenly last week. Mr. Deshme is former rebel leader like Kuruziza 
He was backed by his predecessor and was declared the winner of May's presidential election, which the opposition said was rigged. And that's all we have for you for news updates on COVID-19 360. All right, so that was news updates for you. Shortly, we'll have that conversation to find out how um, these parliamentary aspirants are taking advantage of the COVID-19 period um, to, of course, get in touch with the delegates who would be voting for them at the NPP parliamentary primaries on Saturday. Before that, let's take a look at the global figures. So we, we begin right here in Africa, and as of the last update, we have 268,700 and 68 confirmed cases on the African continent with 5,589 healthcare workers being affected and 7,224 deaths with recoveries now at 123,254. Now South Africa has gone past the 80,000 mark and now at 80,000 412 and in an address yesterday evening the south african president sir ramaphosa says they have been able to flatten the curve in south africa due to the lockdown and certain restrictions that have been imposed and it kept me wondering if indeed they have been able to flatten the curve looking at the figures that they are recording but let's go to egypt and in egypt they have 49,219 confirmed cases and for Egypt, they are just a few hundreds away from the 50,000 mark. And in Egypt, uh, quite a lot of healthcare workers uh, have been affected, especially doctors. And the percentages around 5% to 7% of doctors are being affected in Egypt in terms of the coronavirus. And now we go to Nigeria, which is the third on the African continent, now at 17,735 with Lagos being the epicenter in Nigeria and the Cross River State being the only state that hasn't recorded any case yet. And when we come down here to Ghana, as at the last update that we were given this morning, we've recorded uh, more cases and now our figure is at 12,929. And so I'm sure this website is yet to update the figures over there. And then Algeria with 11,000. 268 and then Cameroon with 10,140. Now let's look at the recoveries on the continent and South Africa as always is leading with 44,331. Egypt with 13,141. Morocco with 7,999 and then Algeria with 7,943. Now let's look at the deaths as well on the continent. And then Egypt is leading when it comes to the deaths. And with 1,850 deaths in Egypt, South Africa with 1,674, Algeria with 799, Sudan 487, and then finally Nigeria with 469. And for the healthcare workers, South Africa is leading with 2,084 healthcare workers and then 14 deaths. Nigeria with 812, with two healthcare workers who have passed on. Egypt having the highest number of deaths when it comes to healthcare workers, with more doctors passing on, and they have 350 healthcare workers as we speak being affected by the novel coronavirus. And then Cameroon with 325. Now let's move over to the Johns Hopkins website and then their dashboard. More figures have been added. And so the total confirmed cases globally stands at 8,359,869 with the United States leading with over 2 million cases and now at 2,163,200. So 2,163,290 cases being recorded in the United States. And then Brazil comes in second with 955,377. And then Russia with 560,279. And Brazil is really close to the 1 million mark. Extremely close. And Russia, 560,279. And then India is now fourth with 366,946. Now let's move over to 
the recoveries and our recoveries globally gone past the 4 million mark. Yesterday we were this close to the 4 million mark and then it's quite impressive to note that we have crossed it finally. And so 4 million and 89,168 and then 400 and over 400,000 deaths also globally recorded. And so Bella? All right, yes. So uh, we've been joined on the line by a parliamentary aspirants from the central region, um, precisely Isikuma Odoben Brakwa constituency, and he is Bright Isilfi Kumi. Now, this particular constituency is regarded a hot spot for the parliamentary primaries this Saturday, and Bright is one of six people seeking to win this seat. Uh, it's a rare case, actually, uh, one of two across 13 regions in 16 constituencies, and we want to find out how he is managing to reach the delegates at this very trying time. And so, hello, Bryce. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you on the line. First of all, what are the challenges in meeting with your delegates to campaign, hopefully to get some votes for them? Um, I, 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 first of all, let me uh, 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 extend greetings to uh, I mean, most of your viewers. Um, and, of course, uh, to extend greetings to the delegates uh, who are very discerning and are ready to really cast their vote. Uh, we all know that COVID-19 issue is pending, of course. So uh, if you count my constituency, uh, yes, there are challenges in terms of uh, social distancing and, of course, uh, uh, all the uh, the COVID-19 protocols. Yeah. What is happening right now is uh, I have these nose masks that are branded because, you know, it's politics. I mean, we are doing campaigning. So, okay. And I have new sanitizers that I give. Uh, more to the point... Mm -hmm. uh, I make sure that uh, social distancing is observed. But you see, the challenge in here is that uh, because they have not witnessed or maybe there hasn't been any case within their village circles and, and the education has not gone down deep well with them as in knowing what actually, I mean, how dangerous this COVID-19 issue is. Yeah. Uh, uh, sometimes, initially, they are all, I mean, very uh, 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 careful in terms of the social distancing. Yeah. And whilst you're talking to them along the line, they forget and some will, might want to even hug you <laughs> for yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> so um, uh, these are some of the challenges because uh, they have not had cases around here. So they feel it is not all that threatening. Okay. Uh, if it's regarding the issue of uh, uh, the contest, uh, the delegates, we have actually reached them in diverse way in the past. We are left with about uh, almost three days to the actual elections, yes. which, uh, God willing, we are going to win, <laughs> and then you are going to call us again for this interview. But we don't have any major challenge apart from the issue of uh, the people's orientation about COVID-19. Okay. And I think uh, why people feel... Well, even some of them, when you put the nose mask on, they yeah. say, ah, what, why are you putting this on? Because nobody is sick here. <laughs> yeah, so, I can yeah, imagine. So but, but you are contesting an incumbent, Mr. Anthony Efa. And in this case where you are saying that you have branded some items, um, you know, to protect these delegates whilst you campaign, do you think that you may be disadvantaged because um, you may not be able to reach all the delegates the way you would want to and maybe this incumbent already has that rapport with them? So even if he does not get the chance to campaign as much, his name is still on the lips of these people and most likely the votes will go in his favor? Uh, if we want to about a Sikuma Dobin Barakwa, is, is it, we, uh, we saw this research conducted by some uh, acclaimed national security apparatus who claim that they had this research, uh, a survey, that, that is really projecting the, uh, the certain MP and one, uh, one, of, one young man who is also trying to contest. Mm -hmm. uh, the situation on the ground is entirely different because... Uh, I wouldn't say because it's an MP2 situation, I wouldn't say that the, M the MP has failed, but mm. the MP doesn't understand the dynamics of, of the political environment and, and, and how it works. Okay. So there has been a lot of losses. Uh, the president is doing a lot to actually make sure that uh, uh, whatever uh, flagship programs and other promises that we made are achieved. But mm. when you come to a support of Mbaka, the situation is different. Uh, okay. uh, we are lagging behind in a lot of things. Uh, mm. Even with the COVID-19, I have not seen any major program going on trying to really educate the people, mobilize okay. them, uh, from, uh, starting from I mean, all corners of the constituency. So uh, to be honest with you, I, I have branded those marks. I, I have the little buckets all over uh, the villages. Um, the villages dominate in this constituency. Yeah. Uh, 
we have a 670 will vote, but uh, Sukuma, the whole of Sukuma has only 88. Hmm. And Blackwa has only 64. And Bobby has 64, yes. So okay. when you put it together, about 500 or close to about 4, 450 plus mm -hmm. are all in the, in the deprived communities. And these areas I have actually uh, initiated projects. I have done community okay. centers. I have done boreholes. I have police stations. Uh, Sukuma main police station in 1942 has never been touched. If you come, you'll okay. see. So the grounds are fertile. It's just that I did not do too much social media projection because yeah. uh, I directed my campaign to those who have the mandate to give me. Instead of going on TV and making when those I'm trying to reach might not be viewing or, or watching the okay. television at that time. So All right. most of the deprived communities don't even have network. Let right. alone have these, uh, I mean, interest in watching news and all that. So okay. um, I directed my campaign to those who to have the mandate the to give people. me. And I'm all right, thank you, you Bright. Uh, okay. By, by Th uh, thank you, Bright. Uh -huh. we, we, we get your message. Thank you. But also another hot spot is the Adansia Sokoa constituency. And we have the incumbent, Mr. K.T. Hammond, who has been challenged for the first time in 20 years um, by Samuel Buafo Dakwa. And so he's joining us via Zoom. Hello, Samuel. Samuel, can you hear us? We had him on just a few seconds ago. I think that uh, we, we, we've lost him, but we'll try and see if we can reach him. Our time is actually up. We'll have to go. If we can't do this interview today, hopefully tomorrow we'll continue with that to find out if he's taking advantage of technology as well to reach the delegates. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting um, you know, spot to, to note. And so we'll see if Mr. Katie Hammond can retain his seat as you know the the representative for NPP in that constituency, and also uh, still re retain his seat as incumbent. And so maybe tomorrow we'll have that conversation. But we've been speaking to Bright Isilfi Kumi, and he's one out of six people who are contesting to win the seat at the Isikuma or Doben Brakwa constituency in the central region. And there you have it. He has some branded items, uh, nose mask inclusive, that he shared to the delegates. And he believes that that, along with the many other things that he's been able to do, will help him um, win the seat. So that's been it for COVID-19 360. The executive instrument uh, to ensure that wearing of mask is mandatory has been passed and so please as you step out especially when you cannot adhere to social distancing directives have your nose mask on so you don't find yourself on the other side of the law